It's kind of a weird thing that's happened with American society, this idea that you have to have a college degree to be a respectable member of the middle class, because as recently as 30 or 40 years ago, that wasn't really true. Hi, I'm Alexis Garcia with Reason TV, and you know him as Instapundent. He's the author of the new book, The New School, How the Information Age Will Save American Education from Itself. Here with me now is Glenn Reynolds. So Glenn, should we be sending our kids to colleges right now? I mean, maybe, but it shouldn't be the thought-free default option. If you send kids to college, there should be an actual reason for it. Uh, and the fact that everybody else is doing it isn't a good enough reason. You write a lot from the student's perspective, but I'm wondering, you know, is there any functions that a university does serve, like scholarship, like your scholarship, well, that could, you know, potentially change kind of the framework there? you could possibly say that it is worth it to go. Well, well from the standpoint of the university, there are loads of reasons to exist, uh, not least of which is, uh, if you've seen that scene from Blazing Saddles where Governor Lepetamine has all his cronies around the table and he says, gentlemen, we've got to protect our phony baloney jobs. I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. But from the student standpoint, uh, given how expensive it is to go to college, there has to be a return sufficient to make it worth the, the time and especially the money. When you could work your way through college by waiting tables, going to college just to sort of find yourself maybe made sense. Now that even most state schools in state work out to about a six-figure proposition by the time you get your degree, if you get your degree, uh, you really have to think about return on investment. And I think people have just started to do that more seriously, and that's actually beginning to have impact on colleges already. You've been preaching for years now that, you know, taking on this debt isn't worth it. Do you think that students are finally starting to listen? Oh yeah, it's really changed. I mean, the psychology of student loan debt, even just over the last five years, ha has changed dramatically. And the reason is, uh, people have heard enough horror stories that it started to sink in. And you know, they used to do this research back in the 80s, when they were trying to figure out what would get people to practice safe sex, what they found was as soon as somebody knew somebody who had AIDS, and it didn't have to be somebody they knew well, it could be you know the friend of a brother or the, something like that, their behavior changed almost overnight. And I think the same kind of thing is happening with student loan debt, that when it was just sort of a vague, abstract concern, people didn't care. But now a lot of people who are entering into college now have relatives or you know older siblings of friends or somebody they know who's basically living in their parents' basement, not able to get a decent job, but with $150,000 in student loan debt. So it's really changed the way they think about it. So would you say then there's maybe an epidemic of that these colleges are facing, that there's going to be a lower entrance rate of, of students actually wanting to get in? Yes, and you're actually seeing that. I mean, you're seeing declining enrollments in some schools. You're seeing much, much more price resistance on the part of both parents and students. And right now, the way schools typically deal with that is not by uh, overtly discounting, although a few places have really cut their tuition, but mostly it's, it's covert discounting, which they call financial aid. But what financial aid really is, is price discrimination. It's a mechanism whereby they can set the price at the highest price you can possibly pay. And they, they've begun to sort of offer more incentives to come to schools as a way of dealing with people's resistance to paying full boat or even close to it. We talk about this bubble and, you know, the eventual burst is coming. What is that going to look like? Well, it's already happening in my world, which is legal education, and the, what it looks like is kind of ugly. I mean, you have law schools that are laying off faculty or encouraging them to take early retirement or buyouts. Uh, you have places whose survival over the next few years is really in doubt because they're tuition-driven and students aren't showing up to pay their high tuitions. Uh, I think you know, law school is being hit harder because there are also some structural changes in the legal market and also uh, it's seen as more optional. People still kind of think that you're not a respectable member of the middle class if you don't have a college degree, uh, and they don't think that about a law degree. So it's hitting us first, but I, I think it's, it's inevitable that it's going to hit colleges uh, in much the same way. And again, you're already seeing the early signs of that even there. A college degree now is a glorified high school degree. Why then do you think that businesses still require that even entry-level jobs that you have to have a four-year degree? Well, there are a couple of reasons. I mean, one is a four-year degree says something. It says that, first of all, it says you come from a socioeconomic group that can go to college, which actually is probably the thing that businesses look for the most. Uh, it also says that you can work with other people and not get kicked out for getting in fights or other uh, unacceptable behavior. You have at least a certain amount of ability to sort of show up when you're supposed to and do what you're supposed to, uh, all of which are fairly useful. Uh, but it's a very expensive signifier. Now, the businesses don't care because it's not expensive for them, at least not directly. Uh, but again, it's, it's a six-figure investment, four or more years of your life. I mean, actually, a lot of students take six years to graduate now. 
Uh, and uh, if all it gets you is sort of you know, your ticket punch like a high school diploma used to be, that's an awfully expensive uh, credential. You talked a little bit about focusing on vocational type training. Uh, you have massive open online courses. Beyond that, do you see anything oh. else that's kind of emerging as an alternative? One of the things we're starting to see uh, is certification, which sort of goes with the vocational training uh, to some degree, where third parties certify that you possess certain skills. And you, you've had that in software for a while with Microsoft certification and things like that. Uh, but you're getting seen in more and more areas. And both one, one way you know this is a trend is that the folks at ETS and ACT have gotten on board, and they are now putting out their own certification tests which basically right now people are supposed to take when they graduate college to prove they actually learned something in college, which tells you something already. Uh, and there's another uh, test called the CLA Plus, uh, which comes from another group uh, that uh, is much more explicitly focused on workplace skills as well. So I think you know, the logical trend for those is for people to say, wait a minute, if we can take the test, why do the college before it? If the test says we're competent and we can rely on the test, why not learn what we need to learn however way works best for us and is cheapest and then take the test and move on. I mean, we've seen this, this the explosion of online learning and these certification courses, but do you think that the business community, are they warming up to it at all? Are they still a little bit wary of, um, of that? It depends on the sector. In the manufacturing industry, they're, they're actually really pushing these certificates uh, because they find that people come out of the educational uh, machinery not knowing how to do the stuff they need anyway. Uh, in other areas, I think we'll see, and of course there'll be some, some areas like your know, high-end publishing and stuff like that where they're going to want you to have a Yale degree just because. Uh, but, you know, those are a relatively small part of the marketplace. And it's kind of a weird thing that's happened with American society, this idea that you have to have a college degree to be a respectable member of the middle class. Because as recently as 30 or 40 years ago, that wasn't really true. And it's not that college has gotten so much better over the last 30 or 40 years. You know, the research shows people learn less in college than they used to. Uh, so it's, it's sort of odd that it's, it's become a status symbol. But status symbols are fundamentally kind of un-American in that regard. And, and the idea that uh, you should have to put in four plus years doing something you don't really want to do just to be taken seriously as, as a member of society seems kind of odd. Do you think that without the recession that we would be talking about this or that there would be as much focus on this higher education bubble that there is now? Yeah, I mean, I think it would have taken longer. You know, they have a saying in the business community that when the tide goes out, you can see who's not wearing pants. And that's what happens with recessions. Uh, and that's happened with higher education. If the economy were booming, the same trends would be underway because the underlying trend is that the tuition costs have increased at more than double the rate of uh, income. And as long as that happens, you've got a gap that can't be filled forever. Uh, if the economy were booming, it wouldn't be as obvious as fast. But you can't, you know, something that can't go on forever won't, as I say in the book. And what can't go on forever is tuition costs growing faster than family incomes. And that's been going on now for 20, 30 years. Yeah, and it's interesting because families, as we talked about, the status symbol still see it as worth leveraging, you know, major debt to send their kids to school. And you know, you just had a daughter go off to college. Did you put any stipulations on her funding? You know, was there a particular major that she had to do? No, but she's going somewhere cheap. Uh, and I think you know, she's she's in an honors program at a inexpensive state school, and it's a good program. But uh, we certainly looked at return on investment, and so did she. I mean, the, she and uh, the kids her age are much more conscious of student loan debt, I think, than people were even five years ago. You can really see it, uh, and. She went to this uh, gifted program that Duke runs as a summer camp, and, and all of them are very focused on return on investment for college because they realize that it's, it's a big deal. What about kids that want just maybe the college experience? Do you see like other cottage <laughs> industries, you know, for budding entrepreneurs out there that want to create just well, yeah, a I hangout mean, for people? Right. The college, I mean, one, one thing I suggest in the book is uh, that, you know, if people want to go to college online, but they still want the college experience, you know, of uh, dorm living and late night pizzas and partying and stuff. I don't know why anybody would want that, by the way. <laughs> well, you know, uh, but the, 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 somebody should just uh, set up a campus, outsource all the teaching, bring, you know, have all the courses online from other places, hire some unemployed PhDs, of whom there are plenty, to act as on-site tutors, uh, and provide just that part, just the dorms and the uh, uh, pizza and stuff like that. And there is a business model, it's not quite the same as that, but High Point University in North Carolina is all about the amenities. And uh, Andy Rosen uh, wrote a book about education a few years ago where he put it up as a cautionary tale of how colleges have become driven by amenities. They're, they have 
uh, single dorm rooms with double beds and kitchens and granite countertops and their own bathroom and everything. Uh, they have ice cream trucks that roam around campus giving out free ice cream. And he said the problem was when he wrote this, as a cautionary tale, everybody read the book, said, I want to go there. So why not just take it to the next level? The state of college right now, you could trace a lot of the problems back through K through 12 education and just what a dismal state that's in. Do you think that the solution for that is just as simple as allowing more choice? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it is, it's actually odd how our current system of public education has introduced so many rigidities into people's lives because where people live, you know, how long their commute is, all kinds of things, how much their house is worth, are all, all driven by basically public school districts. And mm -hmm. you may choose an area for the good schools for your kids, then the school board waves its magic wand and you're redistricted, and now your kids are in bad schools, but you're still stuck with a long commute. And by the way, your property values have dropped $20,000 because of the wave of that magic wand. Uh, so it's not, it's not optimal. And there's no particular reason why somebody should have to commute an hour each way just so their kid can have a decent school. That's just how it's been set up for so long. Uh, there are so many alternatives now that weren't around a few years ago. And it's not only stuff, I mean, you know, 20, 30 years ago, most communities had uh, a public school system. Then there's a private school that was probably religious, usually Catholic. And then maybe there was a Tony or pseudo Tony private prep school. Uh, and those were your choices. Now there's online school, there's homeschooling, there are charter schools, uh, there's just a wide variety of other options. And it's not only that the public schools are getting worse and pushing people out, but it's also that these alternatives that have sprung up are really pulling people in as well because it's just better. Talking about school choice, do you see that option be becoming more politically viable? I think sometimes people think it's you know, a right-wing Republican thing, but then you have people like Sonia Sotomayor, who is a, a product of that. Do you see a way forward for that? Well, school choice is super popular in the inner city, and that makes sense when you look at the, the schools in the inner city. Uh, and, and I think, you know, there are a few Republicans who are beginning to see it as a wedge issue in the inner city, and maybe it is. Uh, but the bottom line is school choice is something everybody wants, uh, really. Uh, and there are, as I say, many more things to choose from. I think a lot of big city schools are basically imploding right now because parents are abandoning them. They're literally closing schools and laying off teachers because they've lost so many people. Uh, and that's really extraordinary when you think about it because from the standpoint of an individual parent at least, uh, public school is basically free. And people are willing to surrender a free good and spend their own money and if they're homeschooling also a lot of their own time educating their kids somewhere else just because the free product is so lousy. Uh, and, and I think that the options that people have now make it much easier to do that. And uh, the thing that will save the public schools if they're smart enough, which remains open to question, uh, is charter schools and other things that let people try new stuff but still under the umbrella of the public school system instead of exiting completely. When I was reading this book and you know, talking about technology saving education, it sounds great, but then you see stories like here in California where they spent a billion dollars on iPads. It seems like the schools can't use the technology to save themselves, well, I, even if they tried. In the book, I explicitly disclaim that I'm recommending <laughs> what I call dumb solutions, like give every kid an iPad. Uh, there's nothing magic about the technology. You know, a kid in a lousy school with an iPad is just a kid in a lousy school who now has an iPad. Uh, what the technology lets you do, though, is it lets you try other approaches. So, for example, you know, the Khan Academy is famous for its flipped classroom model where, you know, in the traditional classroom, the teacher stands up front and lectures. The kids take problems home and try to work them on their own, which is not so great because their parents usually don't know the answers. Under the Khan model, they flip it. The kids watch the lectures on videos at home. Then they come into the classroom and they work the problems when the teacher's right there to help and explain things. Well, it's really not the technology that's doing the work there. It's just making that possible. Yeah, we see people becoming empowered under this movement. And in 2006, you wrote your book, uh, An Army of Davids, and you were very optimistic about how, you know, future and technology would really empower people to make changes. Are you still feeling optimistic about that? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I have to say, you know, it's hard to believe it's been that long since I wrote that book. But uh, most of that has been uh, borne out. And, and you certainly see it in the education area where there is just a whole lot of ferment I mean, there's more change and excitement going on in both K-12 and higher education now than there has been for 100 years. And a lot of stuff that people try is not going to work, uh, but what's left will be something that's new and better. Yeah, and you know, you started Instapendent, you know, right after 9-11. You're the blog father, as you like to call you. And do you still think the blogosphere is kind of this 
force for cultural change, or do you think that it's to becoming co-opted and kind of losing its edge a bit? Well, it depends. I mean, you know, the, it, it's blogging. I remember when blogging was new and exciting, and now it's it's old school. Uh, it's so old school that, like in the in the condo we were renting while we were here in LA, there's a copy of German Glamour, and it has a German article on lifestyle bloggers and. And some of them are called traditional lifestyle bloggers. And I was laughing because I was thinking, about, well, if the Germans <laughs> think it's traditional, <laughs> you know, it must be old. But they're still there. I mean, the truth is there are more people reading blogs now and writing them than there were when people thought they were exciting and new uh, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and, of course, there's lots of other stuff. I mean, blogs were just one of the earliest forms of social media. But you have Twitter. You have Facebook. You have everything that, that's growing up. And uh, there'll be new stuff next year that we're not even talking about now. Uh, the important thing is that it's people talking directly to other people without gatekeepers. And, and I think that that's a good trend and I don't see it going away, though I think a lot of powers that be wish it would. Recently, over the last few years or so, you've become a little bit more outspoken politically. And, you know, we're heading into these midterms. We've got, you know, everyone's already talking about 2016. Do you really think it matters who's in power or do we kind of see now that everything's kind of the same and it's kind of just this kabuki theater going on? I think it matters who's in power. Um, I think that it's true that depending on which party's in power, you get different flavors of lousiness. Uh, but you know, I have flavors I like better than others and flavors I don't like as much. Uh, so I think, I, I think it does matter. Uh, I think that longer term, the question is going to be really how long the two parties are going to be able to uh, run the Kabuki theater and do their best to avoid uh, what people really want. Because uh, the truth is the public has a set of priorities which, uh, and all you have to do even is look at the polls from Gallup or Pew to see that the public's priorities and what Washington considers priorities are very different. And uh, well, I like to say something that can't go on forever won't. I don't think that can go on forever either. So I think there'll be some kind of a realignment uh, that's going to bring those things closer together. Now, speaking of realignment, because we see more people declaring as independents, what do you make about that? <laughs> Neither of the parties has really cover themselves with glory. Uh, and uh, neither one is even in a position to run very effectively on the, well, we may not be great, but we're better than the other guys theory anymore, because that, that's sort of been run into the ground as well. You know, it's hard for me to know when people call themselves independents, sometimes that just means I don't want to take responsibility for my views, or I'm afraid you'll think less of me if I tell you what I really think. Uh, but I do think that, you know, the traditional parties used to be a coalition of interests that really sort of got something out of being in a coalition together. And now I'm not convinced that their breakup value isn't more than their value is going concerns. So many people look to you as a hero. You're a huge figure on the internet. But who is your hero? Who is Glenn Reynolds here? Is there an entrepreneur or an innovator or someone in the legal field that you really look up to? Oh, well, that's interesting. Um, my favorite writer in the entire world, as I've said on my blog, is Arthur Allen Leff, who was a law professor at Yale who died right before I got there. Uh, but uh, he was very big on puncturing people's balloons. And um, my favorite thing that he wrote was a, a piece in the Stanford Law Review called Memorandum for, from the Devil. And it was because Roberto Unger, who was a professor at Harvard, had written a rather pretentious book called Knowledge and Politics. And the last line in the book is, speak, God. And so uh, Leff responded in the form of a memorandum from the devil saying that when non-ironic divine address comes from Langdale Hall, even such as I must take notice. And it was just a brutal uh, takedown of the moral pretentiousness of academia. So I guess that's my big hero. Uh, and uh, I encourage people to look at it. Memorandum from the Devil by Arthur Allen Leff. It's, it's short and some of the best writing you'll read anywhere. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And for Reason TV, I'm Alexis Garcia.